Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we've got uh, 23 people dialed in, so I'm, I'm going to start this. Because I, I know obviously people uh, only got an hour for, for this particular session, and there's a lot of content to go through. Okay, let me just kind of give you a quick introduction about myself. Uh, I've been doing uh, test automation for the last um, 13 years, uh, specializing really uh, recently in uh, emerging technologies such as the cloud, uh, innovation, and uh, kind of anything to do with providing testing, test automation at scale. So um, I hope you enjoyed this, this uh, webinar this afternoon, and um, there's a number of attachments which are available on this presentation for if you want to download the slides. If you've got any problems hearing uh, voice, uh, thankfully this will be recorded, so you'll be able to play it back uh, if you do get uh, disconnected. Okay, all right, well, uh, let's just let's crack on with the presentation. So I don't know how many people have actually done, seen me present before. Um, this is the presentation I actually presented at Eurostar last year. Uh, and there's a lot of content that's on my slides, uh, and I will be going through at quite a, a fast pace. I'll obviously try my best to slow it down, but uh, there's a lot of stuff to get through. Uh, there's this little sample there of what uh, I've got to want to win, which is kind of what I try to do is I put a lot of interesting content on the slide. Usually there's a quote at the bottom, uh, and obviously I'll be talking around the, the topic on that particular slide. I probably won't be going through some of the more complex slides in as much detail, but the advantage, obviously, of being able to play it back, you'll be able to pause and maybe look at some of the, you know, the diagrams uh, and the architecture diagrams. So. Uh, and obviously, you know, I'm more than happy to take questions. Uh, we'll, we'll be focusing on questions at the end, but um, feel free to, to get involved. I, I have put a number of uh, votes for people to kind of get interactive while, while I go through these slides. The, the, just in case you dial in late or uh, you, you're playing this back, I've actually uh, made this available, the, the, all the questions uh, on the on the tas.net.net website. Uh, just click on the... Uh, online survey and, and feel free to, to, to populate that through if you want uh, and I'll try and skip through those. Also, you may notice uh, that there's actually a um, kind of a bit of an interaction as well with Twitter. You feel free to, um, you know, try and guess how many slides is in this pack uh, and the people who come the closest. I'll uh, send a copy of the uh, Experiences of Test Automation ebook. So uh, I don't know, I'm guessing there's a few of you out there who've probably already read this book. Uh, I've got one of the case studies in there uh, about uh, first day automation. So that's really about being able to do your test design before the applications, you know, comes to life. So it's kind of saying, well, you don't have to wait for the solution to be delivered or even to be started to be developed on before you can start describing some of the, uh, some of the stuff that we'll be talking about today. Okay, so looking at, uh, from kind of looking at the attendance list uh, on uh, Meet Me and a couple of the other websites, I noticed that there's, there's quite a mix of people here, and obviously it's a very specialist topic, test automation in the cloud. Uh, so really, I, I have, I've been trying to kind of widen this out uh, so that you know people who are managers, you know, part of the leadership team, the senior leadership team, or the actual testers can try and get something out of it. Uh, and this could be, you know, why, what, when, you know, what, what uh, you know, what are you actually here for? You know, are you trying to, uh, have you got an automation um, tool, uh, automation solution in place? You know, have you, um, you know, are you more involved with the design uh, and, you know, or the planning or the execution? So uh, I, I thought, you know, it would be a big one to start off with. So, uh, but... You know, I want someone. I want everyone to get something out of here. You know, I'm not going to sell you anything. I'm just talking about kind of my experience. Uh, I kind of started off right at the, you know, in, in the 90s with the kind of the early days of Windrunner and, you know, uh, some of those tools at the bottom, <laughs> which uh, give you an idea of kind of how the how the te traditional test automation tools have changed over time. And I think it's quite. It's it's only recently where it's actually there's been this explosion of you know, a lot of different options, and uh, this is an interesting slide, actually. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about this, because uh, I was in a role uh, which wouldn't have existed when I started off, because I started off as an automation 
uh, engineer and, and I ended up taking this role as global head of automation for a very large commodity trading company and um, I turned up on the first day and they sh did pretty much everything what you see here uh, they was they, they had uh, across the globe so there was they had 13 teams that were split up globally in Shanghai and uh, Russia and a number of different other countries uh, and they were all doing different autom levels of automation at different levels of maturity. Uh, some people were using Cucumber, some were using the ATD, BDD stuff, uh, you know, it was a real mix. And it was quite difficult to get that overall view of, you know, uh, the value of all these different automation solutions, whereas, you know, traditionally you, f you found in the past that, um, you know, you typically would only have one or two tools or, or you'd be, you know, you'd, you'd be a HP shop or you'd be, uh, you know, the, you'd, you'd probably go down a route with one particular um, one particular tool set, and I think that's that's quite interesting. Um, to, and I've, I've kind of put out the, the the questions to people saying how many uh, tools do they currently use in their their, their organisation because it's it's really interesting. But you know, to be able to provide that visibility and also that visibility to the right people, I think I, I, when I started on talking about from a leadership point of view. Uh, you know, it's great that you run automation, but what you do with the results is really important. And I think there's a concept which I have uh, called actionable insight, and the idea is that you really want to be able to do something with uh, the information that comes out. And if you see there, there's a dashboard, and that dashboard was actually sat in front of a, a specific de uh, development team who were responsible for those particular builds and, 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 and the failure of some of those builds. Uh, and they got information as it was getting done in real time. You know, we had every we had continuous build and delivery. Uh, we, every every build would go through a, a performance environment, environment and integration environment, and all that information was able to be displayed in in, in a real time dashboard. And I think that's really useful because you know, doing something with it and using that information to give you quick feedback and make real decisions and add business value. So, quite an interesting thing, and you know. <laughs> Historically, I kind of presented this slide back at the NZTB uh, in 2010, and I got the information of kind of which had kind of come from uh, various different studies that was going on, uh, and you know it was it, was, it scared me. And a lot of people have always said, well, you know, there's a high failure rate for automation, and you know that, that it's hard to get return on investment. I don't think return on investment actually is as important. Uh, uh, as, as some people, uh, some managers may look at it, I think it's more on return on uh, effort and also acceleration because, you know, you really want to be able to get actionable insight quicker. You, you know, that's the advantage of the automation and also obviously to take away quite a lot of that, uh, those tedious tasks. And, you know, I, I, I'd like to, to think people are now getting to the point where they, they value automation for more than just, you know, GUI automation, which I think is a very sm only a small part and they're looking at more now, from an integration point of view, you know, be able to actually do stuff which isn't just driving the GUIs. You know, we're talking about, you know, uh, injecting load on, on, on CPUs or traffic or ambient uh, noise profiles, you know, really getting to the point where you're doing a little bit more than just dri driving a standard GUI interface. So, you know, let's talk about the cloud, or I, I like to call it kind of the legacy cloud. Uh, and the, the reasons behind this is, um, I've been I've been so interested in the cloud for such a, a large amount of time, and um, and what I've found is they've, they've, all these different clouds have started to grow. And you've got Amazon, and you've got you know IBM, you've got Microsoft are all doing different things, and they're not really um, they're not complying against any particular standard. Uh, and I kind of got this really awful feeling that in a in in a couple of uh, years time we're going to be calling it legacy cloud where we're just trying to move away from um, you know what was what was there the first time around to actually something which you know you can use you can take what you've done in Amazon and move it straight over to Azure or vice versa and at the moment you know I just don't think there's anything there and you know I, I really hope to see but you know I think it's important and I think this is what this slide really talks about is that it's not just public cloud it's not just Amazon you know you can have uh, hybrid cloud. So, you know, this the solution that we've been um, talking about today was built with the hybrid cloud in mind. So you could actually, yes, you could use it in public, you could use it 
on site, off site, a bit of everything. And, and you know, behind that, and a, a bigger, wider purpose, which is why I'm hoping uh, everyone's here today, is talking about kind of the community clouds. You know, being able to provide services that we can all consume. It was really interesting talking to a close friend of mine the other day who said that um, some of the insurance companies in, in London are, actually do get together and talk about what's working for them and what, you know, what tools and technologies are, are, and what kind of approaches they're using because they actually want as a community to actually go further. And I think, you know, this is something which the automation world really hasn't picked up. You know, we're all in our little silos within our organization building uh, a very cutting edge bespoke framework, but we're not sharing that knowledge. We're all going through experiences and learning how to deal with certain problems, but we're not sharing that information. And, you know, that's what I'd really like to see out of this is to talk about, you know, how we can get together and consume services that we can all use. So somebody comes up with some really good idea on how you can do web service testing. You know, we all can start taking advantage of that instead of having to go through those painful lessons. And, you know, that's for the 13 years that I've gone through my automation kind of career. When I started off, it was a really lonely place out there. There wasn't really that much information about, uh, you know, some of the problems that I was having. And, you know, it was very difficult. There wasn't that much information to, to share. Whereas I think now we're in a different position and, uh, you know, some of the tools, you know, Google's framework and a couple of other things that are coming through, I think really kind of encourages online collaboration. So I think there's another side of cloud as well. I think there's, the, the, there's these, you know, new challenges and opportunities. We, as IT people, you know, we do like our touching the technology and actually knowing we, we can we can grab it, you know, and if it, blue screens, we can actually see the blue screen. If it blue screens like this Windows 8 screen, you can't tell it's in the cloud. It just doesn't communicate anymore. Uh, I think that, that starts on a, lots of different new challenges. And, um, you know, I think we've got to start n not putting our eggs in all in, in one basket. So, you know, I, I, thankfully, I've been doing quite a lot of traveling uh, recently. And, uh, you know, the amount of times that I've gone to various different websites, I, I lived in New Zealand for a couple of years, and uh, I, on the New Zealand Air website, it always go down, and you just have to, you just couldn't do orders, whereas, you know, why do they have to build those systems that you can't just use somebody else's system, or go through BA system, or another system, so that it's a flawless uh, kind of uh, service, and, you know, the CERN services, which like PlayStation, which has had a lot of press uh, about, you know, once that goes down, it's not quite as easy as going directly to the competitors and, you know, go to start using Xbox Live. Uh, it's just not quite that simple. But, you know, I think we've got to start building that idea in where, you know, if we can't use one payment provider, we can use another. Equally with Google Maps, if you can't use Google Maps, you can just go straight onto Bing or, you know, giving yourself a little bit more options. So that way, you know, when systematic failure happens, you know, you're still able to keep up. Uh, and uh, and kind of very recently, I've noticed some, uh, <laughs> thankfully, I've been uh, off work, so I've had the opportunity to, just in the last day, I've, I've noticed quite a few problems just on, on my daily kind of activities. And the first one, which is from this morning, is kind of Lloyd saying, oh, well, you know, this weekend or next weekend, uh, our online capability is not going to be up. Now, I just... You know, it, that would have, I can kind of think that's acceptable maybe five years ago, but it just isn't acceptable anymore. You know, if they do an upgrade, it should be instantly on the, available. You know, Bing do 13 releases to production every single day, uh, and it's, nobody notices the downtime. Well, why is you know a, a banking, a lot, such a large banking company, having that downtime? I think that's probably not as acceptable uh, as it used to be. And equally, you know, you may have heard the problems around SimCity and the fact that. You know, people are going online and they're actually losing, you know, they're spending six hours playing, building a city up and it just disappears. And I had a, thankfully, I had a go and I got, I got this error which said, oh, well, you, you can roll it back. But, you know, I just lost all my stuff. And they kind of, there's a lot out there saying, well, why didn't they use the cloud? You know, why were they using their own data centers? And, you know, I know people who work at EA and uh, in, interesting enough in that they, you can't really see but that middle picture, the guy who actually headed up their testing department, or I think he might have been the CEO, is now you can find him in the game looking for a job. And I think to yourself, well, you know, it's good that you can laugh at yourself, but at the same time, you know, these challenges we've really got to be on top of. And even Bright Talk, which obviously it's working fine at the moment, so I'm, I'm not going to say anything, but 
the new challenges, you know, I was really quite impressed when I came to upload the, the flight pack, which you can download on the attachments page, because it let me pick which geo-based location it was. And I thought to myself, that's fantastic. But, you know, from a tester, how would I traditionally go off and test that? Now, it's fine if you've got uh, offices in all those locations, and you can just, you know, install a tool. Uh, but, you know, if I want to check is it really coming from that, uh, from California or Singapore and the different rates? Now, unless I've got something like a cloud, cloud where I can have a number of different injectors where I can actually monitor the performance of downloading the file, you know, that might be a challenge which you're not quite ready for at the moment. So I think there's a lot of challenges, but obviously it does have a lot of benefits as well. I think there's lots of new opportunities. And, you know, I think, if you look at Facebook, now this is, again, a very, very complex uh, present uh, slide, but, you know, these are all different uh, third-party solutions that actually hang into Facebook, and, um, you know, you can't expect them to have tested them with each other. Maybe they'll have tested it with the standard Facebook API, but, you know, a lot of these tools, you know, I've, I've experienced a lot of problems with them because they just literally do the happy path of, well, it works with Facebook, so... But, you know, if the APIs change, you know, a lot of these kind of tools will just stop, stop working instantaneously. I think, you know, we need to, we need to be very aware of all these new challenges uh, as well as the new opportunities, what can, the power of the, the cloud can bring. Um, and some of those kind of, those, those advantages are things like instant scalability. So, you know, environments on demand, you know, you can pick which, where your about your environments are. Uh, you know, you can uh, scale it up to do uh, performance like uh, testing in the cloud. You know, it's available 99% from any device. You know, you can jump on there. Uh, I was very tempted to try and do this presentation uh, out and about just on my mobile, but I'm, I'm not quite that brave with the cloud as of yet. But, um, you know, I think that's the great thing, being able to get the best of best tools and technologies instantaneously available on any device. I think it's really important because Especially with, you know, bring your own device. I think there's a lot of people who, um, you know, you want to be able to just bring in your iPad or, you know, your Android tablet or whatever the device is. You want to be able to use that. You want to be able to get the information in the format. And you want to be able to access, you know, these tools, these powerful tools, wherever you are, right, whenever you need the information. So I find myself in so many meetings, so many painful meetings most of the time where, you know, I'd love to be able to get information and actually be contributing to the rest of our community uh, doing something which, you know, actually turning something around instead of just sat there listening to, you know, single tasking. So, I know obviously the big one, which is really where I'll be focusing quite a lot today, is kind of the no upfront investment. You know, traditionally, uh, test automation has always been seen as not only just the silver bullet stuff, but the seen as, a, as an expensive thing. And I think that's a lot to blame with, you know, some of the vendors who kind of price themselves out a little bit too high. Uh, I think there's a lot of vendors now are looking at this pay-as-you-use model, so runtime licenses. So you only pay for uh, the licenses when you use them, which is fantastic. You know, you, it, it is an investment to buy the tools. But, you know, one of the slides which I've added in today, actually, I've, I've looked at how much it costs traditionally to, to build a framework per test uh, on average and uh, against the different approaches that you could have potentially taken. And I think it is a very expensive business. And what I did find from that were, uh, was that actually the tools aren't the expensive part. It's, as you'd expect, it's actually the test design and using the tool, uh, which is, you know, the real expensive bit, which is yourself. You know, it's you guys who are actually um, actually using the tools, which is the, the, the main cost. So we've got to really utilize your involvement and uh, as, as best as possible. So. Okay, so where we're going to go today, we're going to talk a, a little bit about some of the technologies, so some of the stuff which uh, we've, we've actually done uh, over the last three years, uh, some of the processes that are involved in making that actually available, and, you know, as I was just kind of saying, the most important area, which is, you know, the people, you know, and how you can use these tools and how you can approach, or even just ask questions, you know, ask questions about why are you guys doing that, or what is the value of automation? I, you know, I love that my favorite question at the moment. You know, tell me what those that 2,000 scripts, what about business value that actually bring into the table? Because, you know, I think people have got this perception of just because they've been running, uh, maybe there's a lot of duplication in there. There's, um, you know, I don't think people are really 
um, kind of you know getting to that point now where they're, they're asking the right questions about how they can maximise what the, uh, their automation is doing. So, so let me talk a little bit about TAS. So, uh, test automation and service is something uh, I'm a, a co-founder. There's a number of other guys who are uh, here and they're on the call today: David Fox uh, and Gordon. And uh, we, we, what happened is we had kind of the perfect opportunity, which was literally we kind of said, okay, let's start from where we want to actually start, which is the cloud in this particular instance, and build something that's specific to the cloud, not a port from, you know, the quality center and then move it to the cloud, which is what they do now. It's actually something that's specifically built with the cloud in mind. And we really wanted to kind of get to that point where we said, let's make it so it's something we can build as a community and extend. And the idea would be, you know, that you can consume this uh, as an end, end user. So it, we picked the Azure platform, which was great. It's all, this solution was all .NET. And, uh, and it, we, we created a portal which the users can come in, they can design their tests and run. And I think one of the great things about kind of this, this idea of, or this concept um, was that you only pay for what you use. So if it doesn't run or it, does, it fails, you know, you're not paying for it. So, whereas you may get a tool or even a framework that you build, and if it's not working, you know, you're paying for that through maintenance or you're paying through that through, you know, your automation team who are really building um, the solutions. So, uh, I'm going to put some interesting questions out there because uh, I, I was starting to do a bit of a presentation uh, for, for the next conference, which was saying, you know, um, rest in peace automation frameworks, because I think they're not quite as relevant you know, building a, a system like the one that I've just mentioned, you know, it's, it's a million pounds worth of investment. And, you know, I just don't think every company needs to spend that. I think they, they definitely want to consume it, but I don't think they want to bring five or six developers for six to 12 months to build a, uh, a, a fantastic solution, uh, which is only going to be used for that one company. It's not going to be made available like the concept behind this to the rest of the community and people can extend it, you know, vendors can say, oh, well, you know, uh, you can use my, t my, my technology to interface with Silverlight or, you know, uh, Flex, or whatever the techno new technologies that's co that come out, like Metro or, or mobile devices. And I, I thankfully have now got to that kind of that relationship where I've been talking to the Microsofts and the Googles. And they kind of say, oh, yeah, we're really interested in this, you know, this idea of a common platform. Uh, I think it's a, a really nice idea that we, we, we start building something together, not not uh, just built for one particular company. And so, you know, I think you kind of think to yourself, well, how do I get to the cloud? And, you know, we've already said about the fact that it's hybrid cloud, so, you know, you can implement this on-site if you're at a bank or you, you're uh, security conscious or you're concerned about things like data. You know, that's one of the big concerns. Uh, and also big data, I think, is, you know, it's still transferring those large files, um, you know, as a typical database, one of the clients that we had was in the terabytes, and, you know, I, I've got, thankfully, I've got a fiber connection today, but, you know, how do you get that amount of information in there? And if you're spinning up a VM or taking an image of a VM and saving that locally, that can, that can quite be quite uh, time-consuming. So, kind of, part of the journey was to say, well, you know, what we'll do is we'll build We'll take what you've got. Some of it could be local desktop applications. Some could be web front-facing website. Could be a software build and delivery process. Could be your test suite, which you've currently got, and virtualize that and have that persistence where you can literally spin it down or spin it up um, and take snapshots and backups and restore databases and all that great stuff that we, we do every day. Uh, in the cloud, and once you've got it there, you know, what we'll do is, you know, we can provide a, a bit of a dashboard where you can go in there, you can, you know, build, you can build your test scripts, you can, you can put test data in there, you know, you've got the advantage of, you know, a flexible uh, pricing and, and the unified reporting, which can integrate with, you know, the tools which you potentially have already for reporting and uh, testing. Uh, and the great thing about that is as new features come online, which is the whole concept around Know, Office 365 is, you know, there isn't an Office 366. You know, there's, there is will now be there won't be a new version. But as new features and functionality and agility is enabled, you can just consume those features. But you'll only pay for the features that you want to use. 
And I think that's really important because a lot of these tools are, you know, exceptionally powerful or some of them are not very powerful, but, you know, you don't utilize all the functionality. So it's, I think getting to that point where you can pick and choose. And it's all about, you know, um, consumer choice, which is something that, again, which I don't think we've really had out there. Um, and so consuming these services, the idea, unfortunately, it's a bit not very clear on this, uh, but, you know, the idea is that lots of different people within the business can use that. You know, you've got the, the test managers who are going in there, checking the status, they're looking at the, um, the, the health of the application, they're getting that in, actionable insight. You've got the QA guys who are, or the testers who are going through scheduling tests, running tests, looking at the results. Uh, you've got the dev team, you've got business users uh, who are going in there and, you know, looking at uh, the user stories or whatever it may be. And what we what we provide is this SOA kind of architecture where you can literally you, know, you can schedule tests. You've got a, a, an asset scraper which goes through and builds reposit, not repositories up and learns the flows through the system. Uh, and they just go off and do that in the background. And what happens is it spins up a VM uh, with an instance which could be client configured, so it have all your security profiles, you know, your applications which you have you know the, the, the particular build that you use if it's you know a certain service pack or a certain version flavor of certain tools um, and then it goes off and loads on the, the necessary technology adapter the platform adapter so you know we, 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 we try to be as agnostic as possible so all this is interchangeable and none of it relies on any particular technology uh, technologies you can swap that out when something better comes about, uh, online uh, there's a quote at the end from the, from the book, uh, which is my favourite quote, which is, you know, we're in a continuous uh, evolution, you know, the, the, as soon as we implement something, something better and, uh, is available, you know, something, there's a new approach, there's a new way of doing a particular, solving a different problem, or, you know, there's a new startup company that have got a great new tool which allows you to uh, interface with BlackBerry version 10 or something, so, you know, it's so quick, the markets, uh, everything's changing, you, by the time you build something, if you're not able to swap that out and you're not able to be technology platform uh, agnostic, um, then you, it's, you're going to keep on having to rebuild and rebuild and rebuild, which is time consuming and also very expensive. So, you know, one of the things um, what we wanted to be able to offer is, you know, simple uh, natural language with content sensitive validation. I think this is one of the concepts that, you know, there's, there's some great things coming out at the moment, ATDD, uh, Elizabeth Hendrickson's uh, kind of new book is really interesting. Uh, but there is a, there's quite a lot of syntax around that. I, I, what I'd like to get to be is where we can all understand how we drive this. Now, we will be talking about this later on, but I want to kind of talk about some of the smarts as well. And what the, the idea with natural language and content-sensitive validation is it understands the relationship of tests. So if you start writing something and it's invalid, uh, most tools would just not tell you. You have to wait till you run, and then it will stop. Whereas this will say, well, actually, no, you can't go from that step to that step because that isn't, you know, there's a, a, a terms and conditions screen that's going to pop up, or you know, you can't enter that kind of information into that list box because there isn't the options in it. They may have been in the previous build, so when you run it again on that one, it doesn't want to come up and say, actually, this is an invalid test. You, know, you want to still run on version one, but version two now is a terms and conditions screen, which is pops up the first time, and then it has a list box with the options aren't the same anymore. So, you know, you want to be able to actually have smart test design. Equally, the other thing which is, again, I find it very, very important is, you know, and Google, uh, do, do, in theory, do this with all their, their tools, is as easy as to get information in, you want to be able to get the information out. So, the idea is you, you don't want to lock yourself into a vendor. Uh, all your your information about your your workflow logic or your business models or and all that you know good stuff you want to be able to take out and put into a format uh, universal formats so that you can move it into another tool if something better comes up on the market uh, a lot of what I see every day is that companies you know build everything into you know selenium or you know they build things into uh, a, a different uh, a new tool that comes up and then what happens is you know all the, the workflow logic and all the important stuff and all the data is all in the format that that tool uses. And if a new tool that comes out on the market, they can't just pick that up and, and drop it somewhere else. Um, I think that's a real shame because I, I'd like to see, you know, being able to get to that point where there's 
you've got the choice to move. You're not locked into a particular vendor, but you know, I think it's important for, for, the, for us to kind of define what that looks like. The next thing really is kind of, you know, the teb, test lab designer. You know, uh, it's quite difficult because, again, it's not, it's going to be virtual. If you want to be able to design uh, your environment, so your environment is very complicated. You know, you might have a number of app servers and load balancing and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, it's not quite as simple as just testing a web service anymore. So, you know, you need to be able to design your, your actual environment under test and then be able to test against it and scale that as well. You want to be able to say, well, actually, you know, we, we were supposed to have 50 uh, end users testing this. We'll have 50 instances all in different geo-based locations. And we want to try, you know, we, the, the app server, we'll have one app server, which is in the US, one was in the UK. You know, you want to be able to do that and do more realistic testing. So I think that's also quite important that you can design those three tiers, not just a single tier, which is uh, what a lot of tools kind of do at the moment. Um, and equally, I think when you, you start running this stuff, you want real information about it. I think, you know, the, again, the actionable insights, you want that information quickly. But you also need, the, you know, the power to say, actually, I want to scale this up. I want to get, you know, I've got, I have got 5,000 tests that I want to run. And, you know, I was, I was talking to Alan Page, um, who uh, works at Microsoft, and he kind of said to me, you know, their entire regression pack takes, 13, 14 weeks worth of execution. And I was kind of saying to them, uh, well, you've got the cloud, you know, why don't you just scale that up? And they, you know, a lot of it is because they've got legacy scripts to do all their the testing on, you know, the, all the different products. But, you know, at the same time, they've not got that ability really at the moment to be able to pick, you know, what's the most valuable tests that they need to run to get the general health of the application to validate that first and then start bring some of the, the lesser uh, value stuff uh, afterwards, which might take you know, three or four days, or you might be able to scale up to 50, 60 uh, online. But you know, sometimes that information is not as relevant. You know, if you've run your regression and you've not found any problems for the last six months, you, may, you might be happy to leave it running overnight. Um, but you know, if it's the information that you want to know about, what, what the quality of the build is straight away, you want to get that information quite quickly. And I think that's another advantage of you know, being able to scale it up into the cloud. And, you know, a lot of what I kind of mentioned before is that it didn't want to be implementation specific. You know, we wanted to be able to allow you to choose uh, the platform or the uh, or what you're actually doing with those tests. And we still call something called uh, test agnostic, test type agnostic. So the idea is you can reuse some of your unit tests or integration tests uh, in your performance testing, you know, because you want to be able to hit a web, uh, a particular WSDL or, you know, you want to be able to hit uh, a particular front end. And, you know, I think we've got to get to that point where we can leverage uh, that so, you know, we can we can all start. We're not duplicating effort. So the idea was, you know, it was platform, technology, client, browser, version, language agnostic. Now, I say language agnostic, uh, I actually mean uh, languages as uh, English or French, uh, and the implementation that we actually did for this, you know, we were able to run the same test written in natural language uh, for a number of different clients, uh, all in different languages. So we were able to do Korean and Frank, French, and you know, the, the discrete small changes like Canadian, which obviously Star uh, Star Canada's that getting <laughs> running at the moment, but you know, those slight variations can change. You know, the obvious the object titles and so on and so forth, which you know, most traditional automation would just say, well, we're going to have to have a separate object repository for French and a separate object repository for, you know, German or w Russian. And, you know, there might be discrete uh, changes that the alignments or the, how the flows are, and that can change. So we, we had to be able to make it so it's generic that you could actually, you know, quickly change it. And actually, yeah, I do want to run it against every type of browser, or I do want to run it on, you know, these type of mobile devices, and it picks the right adapter at the right time. So, I think one of the other things about automation is that um, you know it's typically it's reliant on somebody going off and doing something. You know, kicking off a uh, a, a test through their framework, and you know they might have a number of different types of frameworks. Some of it might be you know part of your continuous build integration, which is great. You know, Team City or Jenkins or something like that. Uh, 
and as soon as a build gets checked in, you know, it goes off and runs the, the health check and all that kind of good stuff. But I think also there's some kind of passive stuff which we, we wanted to kind of include. And one of those was, you know, things like stories. You know, you, you get to a point, a developer kind of says, okay, yeah, I've checked that code in, and these sto- I'm moving these stories across, you know, and as they do that, you, you know, you've got associated tests against those stories. You know, they move across into ready for test or, you know, and it goes off and just runs the pack against it. Or, you know, the, tr- the, the standard traditional thing where you get the, the whole, okay, I found a defect on this particular environment. I want to be able to rerun it. As soon as the defect's fixed, it's been checked in. It goes off and reruns what it did and validates it and then closes it down. You know, how many times I've gone through and just closed things in, in QC, which nobody's checked. Or, you know, they, it's, they've just sat, sat there until somebody actually goes off and does stuff. And I think, you know, automation to me is all about taking some of the, the pain away. Um, and I guess the, the famous conversation that's going on at the moment about checking versus testing, you know, the whole concept behind that is, you know, a lot of that tedious stuff, you want to get automated. You know, you want it to, to get uh, the computer to do that. So you can go off and focus on the high value stuff, you know, the exploratory testing, you know, finding, you know, new ways, new interesting ways of breaking things. You know, I, I'd like to hope that that's where automation really uh, comes and helps out in the future and it takes a lot of the tedious work away. Okay, so let's talk about some of the kind of the processes behind this. Uh, and I, like I said, I, I spent a bit of time trying to work out the cost associated with uh, with automation and mainly around frameworks. And uh, I guess this is kind of talking about uh, the, some of the conversations that have been putting up on the boats about the fact that uh, frameworks are quite expensive. And obviously, you can understand from the point of view of building the framework, uh, it could be a large amount of stuff. It might not be a large amount of stuff, but traditionally, you know, it could range from anything from three to six months or, or less, let's say. But... Uh, what I found is I, I found that what happened with the maintenance associated with frameworks is that you know it's great for that kind of that reaching the, the, the three four times return on effort side of things. But what happens is each time it grows and the pack grows, you find across a number of iterations that you know you're spending more and more time. It gets to the point where it, you know it's actually exceeding. You know, that's where that kind of curve goes. To exceeding doing it manually, which is you know against every the whole point of it, but obviously there's still the advantage of, kind of the acceleration that automation brings. Um, which is the idea is you don't really want to invest that time in in maintenance, uh, which is that being able to help a consumer a test as a test automation as a service. You know the idea is that maintenance is reduced because you're not having to keep the framework working and you know dealing with new types of technology or you know Adobe's moved from version three to four, you know, that might, that was a big kind of step, you know, and some, you find that some vendors like HP, it takes them a long time to react to that. And, you know, that's really quite painful because what happens is you find that you can't run your tests anymore um, because you're locked into a particular vendor. And I've got this concept of uh, manumation as well, which I'll, I'll talk, talk to you about in a little bit uh, as well. So, but, you know, a lot of what we're talking about here is, you know, taking away some of the pain uh, like the test asset loader, you know, the idea is it's self-maintaining. Each time a build runs, it goes through and it checks what's changed in the application and presents that information to the to the user who says, it, you know, is this button supposed to have changed or appeared? Is, and then you can kind of go, well, yeah, that's, that's a new feature. Or I accept that with a particular build. But, you know, you might want to run it on a, diff, uh, a previous build or you need to roll back. You want you don't want to have to make those changes into the, into the code. You want to be able to do, just be able to uh, learn, you know, make that really uh, a universal test language, which you can, uh, you can is more maintainable. Um, and I'm going to put a question up here, which is quite a, an interesting one. It's something which I've, I've been working on, uh, I'd like to say, the last kind of six months. Uh, but I was, I was in Melbourne, uh, for, I was kind of uh, asked by one of the clients to say, you know, uh, one of the, a number of the clients that I've been working on, uh, they kind of asked about you know, what's the best solution for, for them as far as automation. I get this question quite a lot, actually, and um, I think it's quite difficult because, you know, it's not one solution fits all now, and, you know, you can't come at it with the same um, solution every time. I think certain companies are at a certain level of maturity, so 
I, I started working and I was involved with Dorothy Graham in kind of the Automation Maturity Model Index, the idea where, you know, some companies aren't quite ready for, for the certain levels of automation, you know. There might be a number of people on the, on the call at the moment who are saying, well, actually, you know, I'm, I probably aren't ready for cloud at the moment. I've got no cloud-facing apps, you know. Um, I, I don't really have the capacity insights of, of virtualization, but I want to be able to do something with automation, which is where the concept, you know, behind manumation came, which the idea is that, you know, you want to be able to start yourself on that journey that, you know, you might not be there, you might, might not be ready for automation now, but you will, you should be in six months' time. So you could you could have a little tool which is learning how you interact with your application and starting to tech, put data in the format, metadata in the format that you need, building model, business process models off your particular application in the background, and then you come back in three months' time and say, okay, I've got all this information from the last 15 manual runs that we've done with 50 guys, and now I want to automate it. Uh, instead of, you know, having to go in there and say, okay, I've got 2,000 scripts, go up, can I turn all those into automation, which I think is definitely the wrong way to do it. Uh, and some of the things I, I did from this, I, I spent quite a long time trying to work out, you know, against a number of different test cases over the last 10, 12 years um, about, you know, different approaches. And I, I, I started speaking about kind of the hybrid approach, you know, using the best tools and technology for the job, uh, you know, keyword, data-driven, uh, but, you know, this concept of just best of class of available at that particular time. And, you know, there's ATD, ED, and all the, all the new, new ones, which can get you getting automation quite quickly. So there's not really that same cost associated building a traditional uh, client-specific implementation of a framework, which can't be moved and passed on to another client, uh, client even though, some companies do, which is a bit the same. But, you know, you want to get to that point where, you know, you extract it so it's not built specifically for a particular t client. It's something which is more generic and we can all consume, which is the idea behind TAB. Um, and this slide, which, again, I can't really see very well, but is the uh, this, I, I kind of really wanted to look at how much this costs. Now, uh, Stefan Zivokovic and uh, Julie, who's on the call, I spoke to... Um, yesterday about this, and I kind of said, uh, and they both pointed out, you know, you can't really work out what, how, what a test is, what a generic test is, because, you know, they, they, they differ, you know, some might be a thousand steps, some might be five steps, uh, therefore you can't really kind of cost it based on the test, uh, which is where I'm going to go through in a minute, but I noticed a company which uh, I think there might be a couple of guys uh, in the States who are on the call, uh, and they, I'm doing a, a webinar for them this time next week as well, and uh, they said to me, oh, we have a look at this, this company, and they're, they're providing, you know, services based on a, on a per test. So, you know, you, they'll automate each test for $40, uh, and then each time you want to run it, you know, back into this great idea of the pay-as-you-use kind of model, it costs you 75 cents, and we'll do the, the maintenance per week, and it costs you 50 cents per test. It sounds like a really good idea. You know, it's a great model. I like the idea of it. Um, but, you know, if you've got a 1,000 tests, which is what their sample uh, website, I based all these on, on a thousand tests. And you've got iterations of which you have, uh, we have a phase of testing which has a number of iterations, and within those iterations there's a number of cycles of testing, which I think is very traditional. You know, the idea is, you know, you run it the first time, it gets 25% through, and then it, it the, there's some bits that are broken, there's another release, you, know, you quickly go and those are fixed, you can then get to 50%, and then 75%. You know, so what I've done is I worked it out based on you know a thousand test scripts, uh, single phase, uh, phase or sprint, uh, four iterations, uh, and four cycles. And I return on investment and effort was really quite difficult to calculate because I kind of looked at it versus manually doing the, the from a manual effort. And I, I presented back in 2010 this this equation that kind of works out, which is what all that information at the top is. You know uh, what. Uh, it, the, the, the return, what, what your break-even point was, and the, the numbers was about 3.2. So once you've run a test over three times, you've typically got the return on investment. But you know now that you're potentially running eight or nine or ten just to times before you actually you know get a build through, you know that can actually you know it starts making a lot more sense. And I kind of worked out based on the costs from six different projects, which had traditional frameworks put in. I worked out roughly cost about 300 plus pounds to, to per test. 
is quite expensive if you look at it in a comparison to, you know, some of the other, you know, more uh, effective kind of uh, approaches to doing things. And, you know, typically I, I also looked at some of the, the consultancy companies. I mean, thankfully, I've been working for a couple recently, and um, they pretty much charge half of that to do it. And, you know, I think that's that's pretty, that's, that's a really good thing because what, you, what you're doing is you're bringing in specialist skills uh, and you're not having to build those skills in-house. And I think that's where consultancy companies add a lot of value. Uh, obviously, you know, the, the step under there is, you know, and people are worried about kind of the costing at the moment, is that you want to be able to probably do it yourself eventually, but you might not be at the start. So you need the help to get you to that point that you can then build the scenarios and tests and all that kind of stuff yourself, which is, you know, the end game. You know, that's the real big you know, advantage. And so I kind of see... What I'd like to believe is this kind of this testing of the service model where you've got the idea is, you know, it's no longer a company has a test department and has a dev department and has a, you know, a, a pre-prod team or, or a release team or whatever they have. And they have, within that, they have lots of different uh, specialist skills like compliance testing, you know, penetration testing, and performance testing teams. Now, I kind of see that as services which people can, you can get the best people uh, who've got the right levels of skill and they can come in at that right time because a bit like where you can see where the, the two trash cans are. You, know, you find you're delayed by a week, you've got those people sat around and they're not, yes, they probably could go off and do other stuff, but you know, if you only pay for what you want to use, when you want to use it, and it's flexible enough to do it when the release comes through and you're able to scale this up, you know, the, the whole crowdsourcing idea is you, know, you can literally scale to thousands overnight and suddenly get all your testing done. Now, I think that's a fantastic idea, and I'd like us to you know, move away from that traditional idea of saying, oh, well, no, I, I need a performance testing. You know, I've spoken to quite a few of the investment banks recently, and they've got 20 to 30 performance testers working for them. And you kind of think to yourself, you know, if you're an investment bank, yes, you are quite big, but do you really need that amount of expertise in-house? And yes, they do, may do, you know, 15, 20 run the day but still where's, where's the value in that and I kind of I'd, I'd like to be able to open it up to you know a global marketplace not just be people who live based in London you know if you're based in Europe or Eastern Europe you know you want to be able to still have you know a bit of testing but you want to decide how much you want and how much you can afford and then pay as you use so let's talk a little bit back about the fact with this the idea of a test now, like, this is a very difficult thing. You know, I, I came into a client recently, and they wanted to do uh, automate 300 tests in their regression pack. And you know, the quote came through and said, "Oh well, you know, we'll do seven a day, blah blah blah." And I was thinking, well, you know, this is this is very difficult because you just don't know. You know, people might say 300 tests, and it ended up those 300 tests look was something in the region of 92,000 steps. Now that is. Uh, is, a, is very uh, very difficult to look at from an automation point, especially to do within a month. You know, it's more of a, a you know, it's, a, it's very ambitious to say this, at least. And you know, part of that is because you're duplicating the effort. You know, if somebody writes uh, a test script, which, as far as I'm kind of concerned, a test script is instantaneously uh, out of date as soon as you write it. But if I write a description of how I go through and, and process the login screen. Uh, and what I find typically every step that I, I, every test that I open up, it goes through some preamble steps which it has to go through. You're logging in, g going through the menu, going through a different flow to this point where you've got a variation. Uh, and then what happens is, you know, the login changes or, you know, the, vari uh, the flow changes and you have to update all those scenarios. And this isn't anything new. You know, business process modeling, business process testing, it's, you know, it's been around for a very long time. Uh, but my view was, you know, let's let's start making it a bit more visible. You know, be able to provide, you know, this kind of dashboard, which is what I did for one of the clients, which was the ability to actually see various different flows through the system uh, or the solution and the test, and that could be across a number of different platforms as well, or, or a number of different uh, tools or technologies or you know systems. So being able to visualise that is really quite useful because a you were able to uh, validate what you, those tests which you've got were actually correct and what the business was expecting the system to do. But secondly, you're able to visualize that and say, okay, well, look at the dependency here. If this component breaks, 
I can't do this testing because it's part step 408 of 1062. And it's quite easy for people to understand that because you're talking to them in the same language. And uh, I think that's really quite difficult from an automation point of view because typically they go, oh, I've got to go and investigate all these fails. Uh, and then I've got to understand what that step did. And then I've got to go someone tell somebody the account account login admin page is down. And it, it's, if you invest, there's a lot of investigation. I think if you're able to, to visualize it, it's a lot easier. And one of the things we did was doing uh, business process modeling notation, which is a, uh, an open standard. Uh, it creates something called XPDL, uh, which is an extendable process definition language. Uh, and then what we did, did is I actually took those three scenarios and I generated a business process model. So I looked at the common steps and generated a model of the SIP solution and the test. And then what I said is, let's not automate 300 tests. Let's automate something a bit more manageable, like 80, 90 business process scenarios. And a business process scenario is a route through the system. Uh, and you know, the great thing is that uh, because you're creating those reusable components, it's it's quite powerful. Equally, if like we've talked, I've talked a number of times about you know, if you a new component gets introduced as a feature. Uh, like the accept terms and conditions screen, and again, it's, it's not might not be mandatory. It might be once you've uh, clicked it once, it disappears. So it might not be there the next time you log in. You know, you want to be able to express that. You want to express the workflow logic behind it. And you know, like I've just kind of said, with release one and release two, but that path through the system it can get quite complex. And I asked this question out to a number of people, and I said, "Oh, how many routes through that simple five-component system?" Uh, and someone said 20, and I think we, got, we, we counted 25 until we got exceptionally bored, and then I think the real answer came through, which was infinite, which you kind of think to yourself, you know, that's the, that's the pain around associated with, with testing is, you know, you want to be able to go through those flows, and you want to go through them with real data. So, you know, you're not going through the happy path all the time. Uh, you're going through with different users, and different data sets, and different requirements. Uh, so business process scenarios allows you to map a, a flow through the system with an associated set of data, which could be, you know, it could change every time you run it. So you start moving away from these static routes through the system, which is what you know, manual tests. If you document a manual test, you're going through a static route through the system, uh, you know, with a with a maybe a, a different data set, but you know, most of, most of the time they're using the same data. So that, that variation uh, it moves away from the whole concept of you know, the automation just hitting a brick wall. I mean, a lot of what we did with the, the, the content sensitive validation was it would literally say, no, you can't get to log out process unless you go through a request or an access or a managed flow. So it wouldn't fail when it ran. It highlight that it wouldn't be able to run. I think you know, that saved a lot of time uh, for, for testing. I know we're, we've only got about seven minutes, so I, I, I might accelerate a little bit over some of these things. Um, so, kind of uh, the, the idea of data associated with a particular uh, business process uh, scenario and validating it against a moment in time, and the concept behind a moment, moment of time is that these are constantly changing. You know, you may have a build which you deliver to an, uh, of, of a tool which is used by a number of different clients, and each one of those clients have a slightly different change. You know, the usernames uh, are in a different format, so, you know, lo uh, or you know, there's, there's slightly different process of how that that tool works. You know, equally, you know, the location might change. You know, the uh, UK versus France. You know, it's a euro. It's you know, it's British pound. You know, it's they might be. Uh, you know, certain compliance around that saying, well, you know, you must enter this value in here, but you might not need to do it in there, or you might need to a social security ID or something like that. So everything changes, and that's against a moment in time, and that's really important that you're able to build that model, and you're also those emerging test debt assets. They're always changing, but you can you can extract them and extract it based on a particular instance. Um, and let's go on to um, again. I'm not going to spend too long on this one because quite a complex uh, one as well. It's one of the, the, the ideas that we, we did was trying to avoid the whole old concept of you know, having an object map. Uh, so there was no object map. The, the test asset loader built a snapshot of what that application looked like. And it produced things like uh, fuzzy logic. So the concept, 
you know, if there's any automation guys up there, I think you'll kind of already have understood this. But the idea is, you know, you might have got, in the old days, you might have used, you know, an XPath or an ID to identify a particular object. Uh, but in this case, there's a discrete change. They log on to need to log in. You know, you could use a regular expression saying, oh, I want to look for a, 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 a button which starts with L. Well, actually, that's not going to help because you've got log on and log off. Um, you know, descriptive programming, you could put in more information about that. So it's a button, some, uh, it, it's, I'm going to build it up, I'm going to build up the, at the components of it. I've got my log on, which is part of a, a data uh, set. And that, I change that once and it updates everywhere. Great, that sounds great, but you still might have problems around that. Uh, and then fuzzy logic was the idea is it understands it based on the container relationship. So not only did it, uh, it decide which test adapter, which is the tool technology, as we all know, for uh, to actually interact with the, the automation uh, UI kind of technologies. Uh, you wanted to get to that point where it understands the relationship of buttons, and maybe there's a new button on the screen. It understands log off hasn't changed. It understands the relationship of log off and where it goes when it gets logs off. It understands there's a new button there, and it will go press it expects that it's going to take it into a, uh, maybe to the terms and conditions screen, or if that doesn't turn up, it's going to take it to the main menu, and it understands and it learns and it presents the information, which doesn't stop, which is the, the old problem with automation. You know, the, the idea is it, you know, it, it's quite fragile and it requires a lot of maintenance, and that's something we wanted to get rid of. So kind of the message was, you know, you know, businesses should be focusing on being businesses. You know, they shouldn't be building automation frameworks equally. They shouldn't be spending a million pounds building an automation framework, framework, which you may see in the background, um, which is what we, we built for TAS. And, you know, they want to, you know, focus on being businesses. They want to be able to use tools uh, and technologies to accelerate testing, but they don't really need to, to build their own automation solutions, you know. I think we need to start look at providing that information, uh, providing those to companies that are, are, are the testing community. So I talked a little bit about actionable insight. Again, it's a bit, a lot of information on here, but the idea is you wanted to extract it through things like technologies such as funnel virtualization, where you can actually, you know, take a lot of information but extract it at a level which is relevant to the person who's asking the question. And this was really important because, you know, stakeholder management. You know, somebody might be coming in and ask you a, a question of what I like to refer to as a business level question, which is, you know, is my is the batch going to finish within those in, within eight hours? So to understand whether the batch is going to finish in eight hours is going to be, you know, thousands of tests. And this is probably a confidence level which you can say, well, actually, we've only done 40% or we've only done 20%, so we've got X amount of confidence based on, you know, the risk associated with that. Uh, or you may come in at a different angle and go, is my particular task for accounting going to invoice everyone on time? And thus you can say that uh, you can give them the information, again, re relevant to that particular question. I think that's important because at the moment, you know, it's either information overload, you know, thousands of, you know, test reports coming out, and that information isn't somewhere where you can actually do that, you know, actionable insight, you know, be ambassadors of data and really do something with that information. So finally, we're going to go over to the, the, the people, and this isn't going to take very long, but, you know, I hated the idea when people kept on saying to me, testers are testers and not, not uh, programmers, and then, you know, flip it around in the mirror in the lake and say, you know, developers are developers, they're not testers. And, you know, I don't agree with either of those. I, I, I see it as a broken comb, uh, which is Elizabeth's uh, concept, but where, you know, you've all got skills and strengths in certain areas. You know, in this particular case, you know, I probably wouldn't want uh, Dan doing all the testing because, you know, he's a dev, but, you know, he can still add value there. Uh, but one of the trends which I've seen uh, quite recently, and uh, I love Gordon, but uh, you know, I have to say is that people are trying to get these people who are jack of all trades and but the master of none. You know, they're not like Stefan is with 100% testing. You know, that's his life. Uh, but they're not, you know, a, a full-on developer like Dan is. And you know, they're trying to get people who can, you know, try their hand at everything. And I, I think that's great for skills that you need within a company, which is what I think most of you guys out there should be looking for, but I don't think when you want them to get somebody who is fantastic at penetration testing, you know, or fantastic at compliance, or, you know, as Julie, you know, fantastic in usability, you know, we've all got strengths and weaknesses, and I think we've got to start looking at cross-functional teams and, and maximising what those teams' strengths and weaknesses are to, to build our kind of our team, uh, strong teams. Um, 
And I think also, I think a lot of the stuff we do needs to change. I think you know, I've been reviewing the ISO uh, standards and, you know, it's a massive document. You know, it's hard to collaborate on that document. With tracking goes on, thousands of changes. You know, the data doesn't really make sense. You can't, you know, like with Siri, you can't really ask it a question. You know, how do I do um, uh, a particular type of uh, test technique? Uh, you know, these are, you, you can't get any info. You can't ask it questions. You have to go through and find that particular test technique and then drill down and read everything. Whereas, you know, if you can understand the relationship of metadata, then you can actually, you know, you can get information and the relationship of that information and then, you know, do something useful with it in a useful format. Again, the next thing is, you know, dashboards. You know, the fact that you can get a flood of information and a little pie chart that says, you know, 5% failed. Or you can provide the right information for the right person asking the right questions. I think that's, that's quite important. And, you know, equally, this, this kind of, this idea of real-time information, I, you know, I, you know, one of my controversial statements for the for Star, for Star West as well was just ban all email. You know, I've got that snapshot there, three or four, uh, you know, Outlooks, which are all sat in the cloud, which is lovely, but the information's instantaneously out, de out of date. You know, we talked about, you know, test scripts being out of date. Well, email's out of date. The environment's up, the environment's down, the environment's up, the environment's down. I come back after 15 minutes in a meeting, and I don't know, I do know which one to read, because I read the last one, but the rest I just put in my recycle bin. You know, the idea, I don't know, Facebook are now doing the hashtag idea. You know, if you have an environment, and you've got people subscribe to that activity and that activity might be I rely on these environments and something changes the environment when you go in and you click um, you click uh, something to say you know what's the state of the environment you get the information about the environment uh, and also this this idea of re remote collaboration you know the idea that we can all work on the same document at the same time and I'm down to two minutes, so I'm really going to have to finish off. But the idea is, you know, it's no longer just testers who are sat on site. You can have them in the cloud. You know, you can have people who are uh, working. It. But for more of a, a, a global uh, presence, not just something which is sat in a test team in a particular uh, location. So automation should be a global marketplace. It shouldn't just be available to people who are based in one location. This slide which I sent out originally is actually... Some of the questions which I'd recommend reading through this, but it's how you know we looked at what makes a good automation test, and you know it's got to be relevant, effective, manageable, efficient, uh, portable, reliable, and you know you can you actually can get the information out of that. So final thoughts, last slide. Thanks for taking all the time today, Dark guys, to, to come and join me on this this, this webinar, um, and. I hope you've, you've got some information out of there. I'm more than happy to take questions um, offline, so drop me an email or go onto the TAS.net website uh, and just enjoy the, the rest of your, your evening or, or